especially for Jane uh, coming. It's, it means means a lot to me. She and I worked together for many years, so it's a real treat for her to be here. So I thought what I'd do is, is, is talk about uh, some of the very general themes of the book, and then maybe in the discussion period we can get into more details. If, um, um, let me do a, um, just a minute or two of the, um, the history or the origins of, of the book. Um, part of it is, 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 in a way, it's a product of two parts of my professional life. One in philosophy, uh, with special interest in epistemology, the uh, the theory of knowledge, and then I spent many years in in administration, especially as a dean of arts and science. Um, a, as a dean of uh, arts and science, you have a lot of responsibilities. Not all of them interesting. Some some of them interesting. And the the interesting ones are um, you, you get you get to look into different disciplines, see what's going in on in those disciplines, and especially the responsibilities around hiring faculty, promoting them, tenuring them. You, you look at uh, the scholarly credentials of of faculty in, uh, in arts and science. It covers the humanities, the social sciences, and sciences. So you look at scholarly credentials of of faculty in all those areas. Um, you take part in meetings at this university, like most universities, there's, there's a, a faculty committees uh, drawn across disciplines at the university to, to look at the, the scholarly credentials of people being hired and tenured and so forth. So I attended um, a lot of those meetings. and uh, I counted them up for the book, and it uh, was over 700 of those, uh, those meetings. So that's a, a pretty rich set, set of data for um, evaluating and looking looking at uh, the various uh, uh, the various disciplines. And the book the, the book is um, first and foremost uh, uh, a, an attempt to make some generalizations about the kind of knowledge, understanding, and insight uh, you typically see in the sciences versus those you typically see um, in the humanities. Um, but, but um, let, let me talk a little bit about. Um, um, oh, I see. Good. Sorry. I'll talk into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, about a kind of uh, companion aim. Um, uh, I think a companion aim, especially looking back on it, is is uh, that I see it as a, a kind of I don't know a declaration of affection. Um, um, for the humanities and the sciences and for research universities um, generally. It was written at a time, I guess the time is still now, where people talk a lot about uh, the crisis of, of, of the humanities. Um, I think part of the, again, not direct topic, but the indirect topic of the book is um, if there is a crisis, it's, 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 it's not um, an intellectual one, it's not about um, the aims or the quality of the projects uh, in the humanities. In fact, my own view is it's a different, a different kind of problem, a problem um, that um, faces universities generally these days, and not not, not just humanities departments. Um, and put put simply, it's 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 a problem of universities in the faces of lots of pressures. To the contrary, of, of of maintaining a commitment, a commitment that's been at the heart of universities since since the earliest days of universities, to to what might be called a long view and a broad view. Long view in in that um, a, a commitment that um, lots of scholarly endeavors just take a long time; um, they just can't be done overnight. There's long periods needed, often long periods needed to. To appreciate uh, the significance of the work, uh, too, and a commitment to a broad view that universities, again, since the earliest times, is, is committed to uh, supporting, and preserving, and uh, um, knowledge across a wide range of fields—not just a few fields, but a wide range of fields that are of interest uh, interest to to humans. It's um, 
an understatement um, that long and broad views are not in abundant supply in our own time. Um, um, that we tend to be in an era of uh, kind of short-term, short-term thinking, instant sound bites. Um, and so in that context, it's all the more important for universities, again, in the face of, of some pressures to the contrary, to maintain um, a commitment to um, long view and a broad view. The science and humanities are sometimes thought of as uh, rivals, or at least rivals, as, at least for resources. Part, part of my theme tonight is, is they, aren't, um, they aren't rivals. Um, but at least on this issue, uh, they're, they're definitely fellow travelers. Um, um, a focus on uh, short-term and narrow usefulness is, is harmful to both, both the humanities and, and the sciences. But the main theme of the book is, um, again, a more intellectual one, is that uh, the sciences and the humanities um, have different aims, but they're complementary aims, um, different aims and different, different values, actually, uh, different kinds of knowledge and insight that come out of them, and, uh, and different values that are directing them or motivating, motivating them. In a nutshell, the um, the um, there's plenty of seats over here. Uh, um, in, in a nutshell, the um, uh, the differences are um, that I pick out. I pick out four four basic ones. Um, one having to do uh, with uh, indexicality. I'll explain what what I mean by that in a second. That's uh, the sciences try to. Uh, minimize uh, indexicality um, in general, whereas the humanities uh, uh, don't. A second uh, distinction has to do with um, uh, the influences of perspective. Um, there's ways in which science, again, try to, 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 try to minimize uh, perspectival influences, where um, that neither happens nor is it appropriate to happen to, is that to the degree uh, in the humanities that it does in the sciences. Distinction between <clears throat> prescriptive and descriptive conclusions. Descriptive conclusions which um, uh, profess to report what is the case in the world. Prescription, giving recommendations about what, what should be the case. The, the humanities are comfortable and deal with both descriptive and prescriptive. Um, the sciences, um, um, the ideal, they don't always succeed, but the ideal is to, to, uh, to be entirely descriptive. And then finally, um, the sciences are organized around um, efforts to uh, increase the pool of collective knowledge, um, um, uh, to create consensus wherever possible. Um, and in the humanities, uh, there's not as much emphasis, not as much emphasis on, on, um, on creating consensus and, and not as much emphasis uh, and there's the flip side of this, more emphasis on um, individual insight, individual knowledge, even when it isn't particularly helpful in uh, producing, producing consensus. So let me, let me talk about each of those very quickly in, in, in term. The, the term indexicality comes from linguistic and index, an indexical term is, is one that picks out a particular time, place, person, thing. <coughs> so. Proper names are a kind of height of indexicality, so are words like here, now, this. Um, um, so the sciences, with their issues, where at least some of the most, um, um, the most basic sciences, some of those issues, or paradigmatic examples of those issues, concern um, uh, fundamental forces and processes um, governing objects in the world, objects from, from the very, very large planets, oceans, galaxies, to the very, very small molecules, atoms, uh, quarks. Um, in their effort to provide knowledge, understanding of those, those processes, the, the aim is to remove indexicality to the extent possible. Is, the aim is to look for generalizations that are true at all times, places, for, uh, for, uh, for everything, um, to eliminate, um, again, to the extent possible, traces of indexicality. 
So <clears throat> um, uh, one example, um, the theory of gravity, the idea is, is to describe um, uh, the attraction that ob objects with mass have uh, for one another. Um, and to describe accurately, to provide a generalization about that, that attraction <clears throat> that holds not just on Earth and not just in our galaxy, but the entire universe and for, for, for all time. Um, so for, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred years or so, um, the science community thought they had done that through Newton's, Newton's law, then uh, increased um, power of, uh, of astronomy, uh, the instruments of astronomy revealed um, that Newton didn't quite have it right. Uh, Einstein's uh, theory of special relativity, um, to most people's um, uh, minds, took care of that problem, but soon it was discovered that uh, it had problems with uh, quantum mechanics. So, so the search for a completely universal completely categorical uh, theory of gravity continues, continues to this very day. Um, the details of that search, uh, you know, and it's difficult, difficult because the universe is composed of unimaginably large uh, and almost inconceivably small things, and, and to kind of get a theory that handles both is, is, is uh, remarkably difficult. The details of the search matter less than the values that, that are animated, and the values is get rid of indexicality to the extent possible. You may not be able to get rid of it entirely, but you get as close to that as, as, as you can. So in the humanities, with its issues, which are largely issues about human beings and human societies, and not just all human beings and all human societies, but usually about particular humans, particular societies, particular issues, and, and so forth, um, with, respect, with, with respect to those issues, there's, um, um, it's just not possible. Um, the in, insights into those issues have to be um, concerned with the kind of uh, details of particular societies, particular individuals, have to be concerned with, with um, deeply indexical knowledge. In fact, a push of the sort you see in the sciences for ever greater generalizations, ever greater um, applicability is almost an invitation to a kind of shallowness, an invitation that that important important details are getting uh, are getting ignored. So that's the first big difference: minimize indexicality um, versus no uh, uh, continual continual press to to eliminate indexicality. So the second distinct, distinction has to do with the perspective and perspectival influences. Um, to take, take the sentence, this is how things look to me now. That this is how things look to me now. You know, this, now, or, or I should add here. This is how things look to me now from here. Yeah. So there's all um, filled with indexical, uh, indexical terms. But it's, that, but it's the height of a kind of, uh, of a kind of uh, perspectival claim, too. There's various ways of understanding the notion of a perspective uh, or point of view, if you have it. But they're all, they're all wrapped up in um, index, highly indexical features of inquirers or, or groups of inquirers um, having to do with their, um, their uh, particular faculties, their perceptual faculties, how they get information about the world. And, their cognitive abilities, but also their particular uh, location and space-time being here rather than than there. Um, they live in distinctive at those 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 uh, locations. They live in uh, distinctive uh, physical and social environments. Within those social environments, they have their own distinctive histories and experiences. And all those factors shape, inevitably shape, um, um, the way inquirers conduct their inquiries, the conclusions they reach. And there's, there's no way to completely and utterly escape 
from those, from, from those factors. But that being said, it can be perfectly appropriate with respect to some issues to at least try to reduce their influence, to minimize their, their, their influence. You're not going to be able to do it completely, but to, um, to the extent possible. But with other issues, that's not appropriate. Um, it's, neither, it's neither feasible nor desirable. And that distinction very roughly gets mapped onto a distinction between um, what's going on in <coughs> uh, scientific inquiry and that what's going on in, in, in the humanities. <coughs> the, the attempts to minimize perspectival influences are, you can see in almost all the standard practices of the sciences, uh, the, the idea that um, experiments be, uh, have to be repeatable, um, um, their results have to be publicly observable and have to be capable of being quantified. There's um, a regular use of instruments uh, to measure those quantities of, of the result. There's the presence in the sciences of uh, large, sometimes very, very large uh, team uh, research projects. And then there's also the use of Mathematics is the common, uh, the common language. All those are, in one way or another, meant to reduce possible distortions, possible limitations from uh, arising from uh, the perspective of the inquirer or, 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 or set of inquirers. Um, but at the same time, it broadens the potential audience. Uh, broadens the potential audience because if you're developing, if, if 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 you're developing theories that are not closely tied to the perspective of 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 the inquirer, it means they will in principle be understandable uh, by others in other contexts with other uh, with other with other perspectives, um, assuming that they're. Uh, sufficiently advanced. Sufficiently advanced is deliberately vague. It's it's meant to indicate that the results, um, um, in principle, be accessible to hu other human inquirers uh, living in different places, uh, times, cultures, using different languages, etc. Um, but even in the limiting case. Uh, accessible if there are uh, other intelligent creatures uh, in the universe to, uh, to sufficiently intelligent creatures um, elsewhere who have who have faculties and abilities unlike ours and who live in groups or societies unlike un unlike ours um, the working assumption in the sciences is, is that in search in searching for generalizations that are true across the board, true every time, place, so forth. The, the, the assumption is not that those generalizations, those truths, would be accessible only to humans, only to, only, only to, to, to people with um, human-like faculties and human-like locations. It, it, it's exactly the opposite. It's the, it's the, way, to, the way to pursue those, uh, those, those insights is to escape to the extent possible Again, recognizing that complete escape is not is not in the offing, is uh, the human contingencies. Um, um, so it's it's a common theme of science that the, the the structure of the world, the structure of things, is not always as it appears to us with our with with our with our faculties. So you have in in physics a world of probability waves and subatomic particles that are in fields that are that are colorless that are tasteless that are odorless and that's a far cry from the three-dimensional world uh, the, the world of three-dimensional objects that we all experience with our faculties as having color <coughs> tastes and and so forth so in the humanities by contrast um, 
where the issues are about other human beings, other human society, largely about other human beings, uh, societies, and um, and their issues deeply entangled with human human consciousness. There, there, there's no there's no such pressure. In fact, the idea is to try to to try to take advantage of of, of, of your human perspective, and as best you can to extrapolate outward to understand people in different situations, different different parts of the world, different different times. Mm -hmm. well, that's uh, that's difficult and and um, um, and, uh, and challenging. But but the point here, uh, the, the basic point here is this, is that that th there's no reason to think that with the basic issues of science that humans are in a particularly privileged position to get to, to, to get at those truths uh, uh, in a better position than any other conceivable intelligent being anywhere else in the in the universe if there are if there are such beings but when it comes to the issues in the humanities which again are largely about humans human beings uh, kind, and they're kind of uh, inflected with with issues of, of, of human consciousness human empires have a leg up they have a leg up because they know what it's like to be a human. They know what it's like to live in a human society. They know what human consciousness is like. Again, th think about those imaginary, or, or who knows whether they're imaginary, those hypothetical, super intelligent creatures somewhere else in the, in the, in the universe whose faculties are quite different than ours and whose societies and living conditions are quite different than ours. No matter how smart they are, there's going to be more challenges for them to understanding the issues, characteristic of humanities, they're, they're about human societies, human beings, and hum, human history, and human art, and so forth, than it is it is for us, because we we live in a human society, we have human experiences, and and so forth. So far from trying to escape, to the extent possible. The contingencies of of of, uh, of the human perspective. The idea in the humanities, you, you got to make the use. You got to make the use of it. In fact, when you think about it, the, the humanities really have to be triply concerned with um, perspective. Triply concerned because the investigator, the scholar, they have to be concerned with you know using their own perspective, their own experiences, their own history, and so forth. But the objects of study are usually other human beings as well. Again, not always. There are some issues that are not about other, but they're largely about other human beings, other human societies. So and what you're interested in doing is you get trying to get insights into their perspective, their, uh, their points of view, their beliefs, their values, so forth. Um, and moreover, you're trying to come up with an account for this for, for a particular audience. Un unlike the sciences, where the where the audience is is um, the aim is to make it um, as unlimited as possible, as broad a scope as possible. You know, it doesn't matter where, where you are, what time you live, what culture you're in, and so forth. The, the audience in the humanities is always more limited. It's always more limited to a to a, to a targeted audience, and you got to think you got to think about their perspective, their point of view, and try to find overlaps with your own. That will commonalities with your own that will allow the um, you to explain to them what's going on um, in the society with these with these with these subjects. So th third, the third um, is prescriptive uh, versus descriptive. I'll do that. I'll do that quickly. Um, so the humanities are 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 comfortable and deal with both. Um, uh, prescriptive conclusions about what should be the case, what people should have done, um, as well as well as um, as well as descriptive. Um, when, I, when I started taking notes, uh, this book, um, one of the one of the, the donors uh, that we were working with in arts and science was was a person who was interested in military history, and I wasn't never been particularly interested in military history, but he got me to. To, to read a book, which I had quite, 
quite a good book by a guy named Clayton about the Battle of Waterloo, called Four Days to Change the World. And this book is um, an immensely detailed account of, of um, why the battle um, unfolded in the way it did. You know, there's details about the size of the armies and their their artillery and their positions and the weather and you know it's it just but it, it you know it's it's a long book um, in the course of this book the author uh, Clayton also makes um, evaluative judgments about about decisions that uh, the military commanders Napoleon especially um, uh, could have made differently should have made differently according according to Clayton. Um, um, a decision, one of the decisions, I don't remember all the details, but one of it was the, the um, decision not to um, not to engage in battle uh, until noon the next day, uh, given that it had heavily rained. And there's some details that that ended up disadvantaging um, Napoleon's uh, forces. But the key point here is, is not, you know, whether Clayton is right or that, but it was perfectly appropriate, perfectly okay in this, this book, in the midst of this detailed description of the battle, to bring in an, an evaluative judgment and said, well, look, you know, Napoleon really should have done this instead of that. It really would have been um, much better, and he really wasn't open enough to unconventional um, a military tax. He wasn't as open as, as he should have been. And those values come from outside history, come from outside history. It's, it's the author's kind of views about military leadership, political leadership in general. Um, so the descriptive accuracy is a prerequisite, but there are prescriptive judgments. And of course, there, there are plenty of other areas in, in the humanities where the prescriptive elements uh, dominate. Um, uh, one's about, I don't know, uh, T.S. Eliot's uh, status as a 20th century poet. Um, it was a huge amount of work maybe about a decade ago that actually in part led to Spielberg's movie about uh, Lincoln, um, about uh, uh, the trade-offs Lincoln agreed to uh, to get the Emancipation Proclamation passed. You know, clearly evaluated judgments about whether those trade-offs uh, were appropriate, whether they weren't appropriate, and so forth. And of course, in my own field of philosophy, there's plenty of, um, plenty of uh, uh, works that aspire to, to tell you know, what a good human life is, what a best political system is, of course, literary criticism to tell you how to, how to approach novels or certain kind of science novels. All these are concerned with um, making recommendations about what should be valued, um, whereas the sciences, the, 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 the aspiration is to be completely and utterly um, um, descriptive, to avoid evaluative judgments and to avoid um, political, religious, um, ethical values influencing the conclusions raised. And again, there are, there are plenty of examples in the history of science where the community of sciences didn't live up to that ideal. But the point I'm making is that that is the ideal uh, that, and which they can be criticized for if they don't, they don't live up to. So the fourth distinction is um, uh, collective knowledge, um, where sciences are organized towards that. Um, there, um, um, which is not to say that individual achievement doesn't matter. It, it obviously does matter, but uh, the, the kind of key mechanism in the sciences for um, getting individual achievement to uh, to promote the collective stock of knowledge is the division of intellectual labor, where uh, big problems are. Uh, broken into small components. You encourage investigators to get um, highly specialized knowledge of those components. Uh, they make their research public, um, verified by others, checked by others, um, but then also used by others after all that is done, used by others, and used by others even if 
they, the others, given the highly specialized nature of the knowledge, are not really able to defend it on, on, on their own. They have to rely on the authority of, um, of, of the people who produce the knowledge. All, all that has a, a much smaller part in, in the humanities. The humanities, it's not that humanities aren't communal enterprises in all sorts of ways, they are, but there's, but there's a much more individualistic flavor to them, individualistic in that um, individual insight is valued, it counts, even when it isn't likely to help produce a consensus. Some of the issues in humanities, you shouldn't even expect a, a consensus. Um, so consensus, arriving at consensus and uh, uh, a collective pool of knowledge is not, doesn't have the central role in the humanities that it does in the, in the sciences. Um, there's also different ways in which influence uh, works. Again, these are broad tendencies. Um, there's a much greater emphasis in the humanities on uh, uh, intellectual self-reliance, um, not deferring to authority, um, and a much greater, em a greater uh, emphasis on what's uh, sometimes called uh, Socratic influence. So Socratic influence is, 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 is suppose you're the expert and um, you, through uh, a series of really good questions and instructions, eventually get me to believe what you believe and to understand what you understand such that I can, at least in a limited way, maybe not as well as you, but I can um, d defend the view. Um, um, I know how to, how to do that. In, in that kind of case, I'm no longer relying on your authority. I'm no longer depending on your authority. You've influenced me. You've had Socratic influence. But I now get it on my own. I understand it on my own or largely get it. I can defend it on my own. And, there, and, the, and there's a way of thinking of the role of scholars in the humanities as their first and foremost responsibility being that of exerting Socratic influence or getting other people in a position to, to understand the issues in such a way that they, maybe not in as complete a way as, as, as the experts themselves, but, but in a way can, 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 can defend, defend the issues um, uh, themselves. So, um, you know, there are exceptions to that. There are areas in the humanities where, where deference is, is, is perfectly okay, um, um, but, but they're, they're more limited than uh, the sciences. And then there, there are places in the sciences where, where Socratic influence is crucially important. But again, there's this different, um, these different in, um, in relative emphases. So those, those are the four main differences. One of the other th big themes of the book is those four main differences um, lead to a set of secondary differences which kind of fill in um, uh, the personalities of the humanities and sciences. The, the, the secondary differences include um, different views about uh, the possibility of there being an endpoint an in of inquiry into issues. Science is more comfortable with that. Uh, humanity is less comfortable with that. Um, there's different notions of progress, and maybe I'll talk about those in for just a second in a minute. Uh, there's different ways in which classic works in the two areas are treated and re and 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 and, uh, and and regarded. Um, there's different different assumptions about simplicity and complexity different degrees of comfort with what might, might be called mentality, kind of issues of, 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 of consciousness. Um, so I have a little time, so let me, let me, let me spend just a couple of minutes on, um, on uh, well, I'll do, I'll do progress, and then if we have time, we'll spend a couple of minutes on simplicity. So the humanities are frequently criticized for saying, you know, there's not the amount of progress, the kind of progress uh, 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 that there is in, in, the, in the sciences. Um, but those critiques usually assume that uh, uh, the nature of progress is the same 
in the two areas. But the issues are different, the inquiries are different, and, and the kind of progress that's possible is different, uh, d different as well. It, it, in the humanities, the, um, if, if, you had to, if you had to visualize the notion of progress, it can be visualized as occurring on a, on a vertical axis um, where, where you're going up and you're getting closer and closer to a collectively agreed upon endpoint. Um, in, the, in the humanities, with respect to their issues, progress has to be thought of more in terms of greater precision, greater clarity, more coherence, more breadth, um, more precision and clarity is usually done by um, introducing uh, introducing more indexical details and and distinctions. Um, Helen Small, in her uh, terrific book on the humanities, talks about um, the pleasure uh, in the humanities the, uh, of, of taking a pleasure in the uh, specificity of the object studied. Um, so, so there's a lot of details and kind of getting into those details. Um, so um, coherence is, is a matter, and more breadth is a matter of, of, of hooking up the issue you're talking about to other issues. Um, um, often there are issues within the field. Um, whether it be history or, or literature or philosophy, but, but also issues outside the field, uh, scientific advances, um, political and social movements uh, or, or uh, evolving social and political standards. Um, so, and, and, and when that's done well, the, the I think the way to visualize it is not in terms of, um, um, it's not on a vertical axis, it's more on a horizontal axis, where you, where, where you think of the progress coming, where the, the details and, and the additional um, distinctions, it's as, it's as if there's kind of more plotted points on the, the density of plotted points on the axis, and then hooking them up with other issues, both within the field and outside the field, you get a, you get a larger spread as well, so it's, um, for me, it's useful to think of, of analogy with uh, the development of a body of law over time, and, uh, and especially the role that appellate judges, I mean, law changes because sometimes the legislature changes, but, but judges, appellate judges, are in the business of, of taking existing law and trying um, to apply it, to extend it, make it relevant to new emerging realities. The realities, again, may be social or political developments. New realities may be economic uh, uh, changes. They may be um, um, scientific and tech, uh, technological um, um, advances. Um, and, the, and the role of appellate judges is to um, you know, get their minds around those changes, get their minds around the facts of the case, get their minds around um, 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 previous uh, precedents which might bear on, on the case. But at the end, they usually also have to draw upon social, political, ethical values from outside the law in figuring out what's the right way to extend the law. Um, in, in these, these, these particular cases. And when all that again goes well, the result is um, a body of law that has great, a wider applicability, more precision, coherence, in other words, horizontal progress. Um, or you know, if you want to call it development, that's fine with me. Um, uh, the terminology doesn't matter. What what does matter is that the picture is not one of stasis. Things are happening in in response to new circumstances, new conditions, which are which which are which are which which are evolving. Um, I'll do just one more thing, and then then we'll, no, no, we'll open up. Um, simplicity and complexity. So. In, 
in the sciences, a common assumption is that nature is simple. And so all else being equal, the simpler the theory, the fewer the, the fewer the, the fewer the postulates, the better. I mean, uh, the, many of the great icons in the history of science, from Newton to uh, Galileo to Einstein, all explicitly kind of endorse this kind of view that um, of simplicity and um, simplicity in nature. In the in the humanities, there's there's nowhere near that. Um, um, premium placed on simplicity. In fact, it's just the opposite. Sometimes it's it's a warning flag, a warning flag that again the details are getting overlooked, or maybe um, an overly simplistic ideology is at work. Um, a, a taste, a taste for some complexity um, ought to be ought to be the norm. This isn't to say there's plenty of areas of science, especially applications of science, um, in various areas where, where um, there's I don't know, resistance to over too much uh, simplicity that you need to kind of, if you're thinking about a system, whether it's an environmental system or the, the human body as a system, you know, you're going to have this holistic sense of how all the parts interact with one another, so there's a kind of Resistance, but still, the, the the basic push is is especially in the basic sciences for greater greater um, s simplicity. So, th this difference between the humanities and the sciences with respect to simplicity um, and complexity get, get gets played out um, in especially uh, conspicuous, dramatic ways when it comes to questions of studying human beings. Where you have human inquirers stu studying their fellow, their, their, their fellow humans. Now the sciences, um, it's only a very small percentage of the issues in the sciences that are concerned with, 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 with human beings. I mean, after all, it's, um, it's only a very small percentage of everything there is in the universe. Only a very small percentage of those are living things, and only a very small percentage of living things are humans. So, so it's a relatively small percentage of. of the sciences are concerned with studies of human beings. But when they do study, the tendency is to take an approach um, that's very, very different um, than the humanities. Um, now, now, I've been talking all through here in kind of broad terms. Now I'm going to talk in even broader terms. If you, if you kind of got a, a, a viewpoint up in the clouds and you were kind of looking down on, on um, uh, the kind of inquiries that humans make about their their fellow humans, um, you could divide them into two broad categories: those that are really pushing hard and looking for similarities among humans, and those that are really um, looking for differences among humans. And again, with all sorts of exceptions, all sorts of this and that, that divide is roughly a divide between between the humanities and the sciences. The, the sciences tell us that humans are remarkably like one another. They're actually remarkably like other, other living things. Genetically, um, uh, there's uh, um, huge, huge overlap um, between humans, um, fruit flies, um, Earthworms. <laughs> um, that I mean, the the, the working aphorism, aphorism is that um, um, all life is one, um, and it's the same basic ingredients: DNA, RNA, proteins, carbohydrates that are the ingredients of all known life, and um, and it's the same processes that work on those ingredients. Again, in humans, fruit flies, worms, um, even yeast. Th the similarity is actually pretty astonishing. But, this is the big but, um, we tend to be fascinated, preoccupied, maybe even obsessed with differences as well. Differences between us and other living creatures, and, and especially differences amongst 
you know, our fellow our fellow humans. We make, and a sign of this, we, we, we make more distinctions about one another than we make about anything else. Um, you know, we distinguish um, physical characteristics, emotional characteristics. Uh, we, distinguish, we make distinctions of ethnicity, nationality, occupation, class. You know, the list goes on and on. And we're interested, of course, in um, finding correlations between um, uh, between these differences, it, it, it's it's an interesting question to think about. You know why it is, given that we seem so s similar. Why why we're so interested, uh, so focused on on differences. You know, one explanation is you know maybe that helps us navigate the complications of, of social relations and so social lives. But but whatever the explanation. It's with those fine distinctions that um, that the humanities come in um, that, that the humanities come into their come into their own with with marking those uh, with marking those distinctions. So um, and again, there there are plenty of exceptions. There, you know, there's plenty of exceptions where um, where Sciences aren't so obsessed with simplicity, and and, they, and there are areas in the humanities where um, th there are different works in the humanities that um, cast the work more broadly or more narrowly. So, so in history, for example, there there's there's historians that focus on uh, the characteristics of individual human beings or groups, or looking very carefully what's distinctive about this time or this situation. But other, others, others go up a level and, and, and aren't so preoccupied with um, individual or group differences or um, try to look and they try to offer historical explanations in terms of um, um, broader economic or political trends. There are ones that go up even further to try to provide um, explanations in terms of such very general factors where, where individual agency seems n not involved at all um, or minimally involved, um, where the explanations are in, are in terms of climate differences in different parts of the world or, um, or uh, different diversity in plant and, and animal life in different, different parts of the world. So there are exceptions, but the the tendencies in the two areas are, are really poles apart. In one, it's um, it's um, kind of assimilating things to one one another, and the other is uh, making distinctions among things. There's power in both, but um, but they but but they're different. So let me uh, let me uh, 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 quit the well, Let me finish with the thing where I started. Is I, I think. Probably everybody in this room is um, already convinced of this, but um, um, uh, about the need of universities generally to um, protect and nourish w what I call the long and the broad, um, 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 nourish scholarship that takes a long time, nourish scholarship across a wide range. My topics have been the humanities and the sciences, and I guess the, the Underlying theme here is, is, is if, 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 if universities are going to do a good job of this, of nourishing this full range, they have to understand them. And in this case, understanding the science and humanities means understanding that, that, that they are different. Um, the inquiries are different. Their needs are different. Um, and you would hope also an appreciation that those differences are a good thing, it's in fact, a very, very good thing. So let me stop there. Thank you, Professor Foley. It's a rich, interesting conversation talk. Now, Jane, is your turn. <laughs> oh, I have a question, so I can. Yeah. Um, we can wait, but I prefer that you speak before me. Yeah, I can, I can do. Okay, so I can go whenever or and sit wherever. Let me just sit right here next to it. Okay. Well, thank you, Dick, for a, a wonderful talk, um, a wonderful book. I'll Good. show it again to those of you who didn't see it from the corner. Um, and I and I have to add, you know, being such a wonderful dean, I mean, you can tell Speak from your. Loud, sorry. I'm sorry, and for being such a wonderful dean, I, you know, 
full disclosure, um, uh, Dick hired me in <laughs> 2002, was behind my coming to NYU. I, and did, I did some good things, but this was one of the best <laughs> I did. <here. laughs> and I'm very grateful. And, uh, and I think really through the remarks you've just heard, I think it really reflects as to why he was such a tremendous dean for the college and why it really thrived um, and has thrived since, um, in the years since he's been dean. So, you know, you, you, you ended on, on the note, uh, which I think is, especially as a, as a humanities person, um, is so crucial to be thinking about that, especially in a time when maybe more the perception than the reality, but, right. but certainly the perception, you know, all the money's going to STEM. Um, all of our students are going to STEM. Um, you know, the, the, there, there's just this kind of, um, uh, just dispersion of, of, of students from what had been, um, even in the social sciences, um, into, um, into what is now computer science and less so the biological sciences. And so I think your, you know, your, your closing point that you know, deans, administrators especially, but also, you know, also faculty and also students themselves need to realize and be quite aware how different these ways of thinking, and, and to quote your title, the how, how different these geographies of insight mm -hmm. Um, really are. Um, you also use the word inquiry a lot in, throughout the book and, you know, very different methods of inquiry. And I think that, that, that reading this, this wonderful book, um, it shows your own breadth and your own long view um, in terms of coming to the, you know, the epistemologies of knowing, the epistemologies of these different divisions. But um, there are a few moments that betray your humanist um, <laughs> training and, I, I think, inclinations. And I guess my favorite one, and I'm just going to read a passage um, since I have had the uh, benefit of reading um, your entire book, which is really, you know, I can't say how, how beautifully written it is and how modest Dick is as a, as a narrator and as a speaker. But um, I'm just going to read this one paragraph, um, which comes from uh, one of the later chapters. Um, Fellow guests at a party have sometimes asked me, how interesting it is that you're a philosopher, but tell me, what's your philosophy? I usually respond with something earnest and I hope understandable about the field, but occasionally, out of tiredness or perhaps childishness, I don't know, I think you're being very, again, too modest here, I've heard myself saying, well, my philosophy is quite simple. It's that everything is really more complex than it seems. Um, so your parting uh, shot was about how complex the humanities really are and the scientists are always trying to dive down and become more simple. And I, I, you know, I love that response. I think it's a wonderful response. And I think a lot of us in the humanities do try, do try to do that. Um, and yet to think about what our scientist friends are doing, um, you know, takes, takes a big step. Um, for sure. So, um, so I really love that moment. So I guess, you know, I've, I've one observation and maybe one or two questions, yep, if, yep. if it's okay. Um, yep. The observation is, you know, Marie, Marie Louisa, um, in her far too long introduction, um, you know, mentioned that I, I focus mainly on the Renaissance. And, you know, as you were talking and as I was reading, I was thinking, you know, in the Renaissance, I don't know that they were, I don't know that these divisions, yeah. I don't know that this book could have been written, yeah. right? Um, and I was asking myself why. Um, you know, you think of a Leonardo, um, who is, and, and you think of the cliche Renaissance man, right. right? You know, Leonardo was Renaissance man, Galileo was Renaissance man. I mean, Leonardo, a brilliant artist, but also we would call him a brilliant scientist with his many, many drawings and books and his many kind of just, you know, musings and reflections on various objects in the world, whether they're animals or human beings or um, other things out there in nature and trying to somehow capture them you know, on paper and in his thoughts. And then, you know, two centuries later, you have a Galileo who um, is on the one hand, you know, he's got his telescopes and all his lenses and trying to figure out, you know, about the moon and what's really at the center of the, of the, of the, of the um, solar system. But he's also reading and we have his notes on these great poets, you know, Tasso and Ariosto and, you know, writing his own wonderful, very playful dialogues and things like that. And so, um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, this is not that long ago. Um, this is a period when, you know, you don't have divisions in schools of different disciplines. And, and so observation slash question is, you know, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. um, is this, you know, is the Renaissance moment something we should not look back to just with nostalgia or perhaps try to embody um, more in what we do as scholars and as administrators and, and all of that? Um, or is this just part of this progress? You know, you mentioned about the kind of linear, linearity of the sciences, you know, have the, did the sciences progress through a more artistic apprehension, mm -hmm. as it were, of nature to come to the point where we are now? Um, I have, I don't know much about sciences except what I know through my son who trained as a cellist and is now in his second year of computer science, um, a PhD in computer science. 
at the University of Washington, and and he is working with his two advisors on something I never heard of before, but it seems like a lot of a lot of my own students know what this is. It's called the traveling salesman problem, which is basically how can your traveling salesman? What's the most efficient route for a traveling salesman who needs to go to 50 cities? And so the plan is that you've got to come up with the algorithm that will always work. You know, as you were saying, you know, you need something that can be universal and it's not location dependent. And um, and so I see him, you know, working on this, and I and I and I, and I say to him sometimes, I say, well, you, you know, so you're interested in efficiency, but I'm interested in, you know, more spiritual and you know other interesting values. And he says, no, I'm interested in beauty, you know, the beauty of simplicity or the beauty of the elegance of this new algorithm. And it's been it's been very interesting on a lot of levels engaging with him. I think one other aspect of his work, which leaves me realizing what a horrible graduate advisor I've always been, is that he meets with his advisors almost every day. And I realize that this is a collaboration in which all three of them are involved. Right, right. Um, they're solving a problem that they didn't invent, right? It's been handed down. Right. They think they're getting closer, but they're getting closer to a better solution, but not to the solution. They realize they're part of this chain. Right. And so I, so I do feel like that one way, so if, if on the one hand perhaps the sciences originated in a kind of artistic consciousness that it's moved away from, and maybe that's a bad thing from our perspective, I think a good thing that the scientists, that the scientists do um, that we don't do as much, and you reference this a little bit in one of your chapters, is this hugely collaborative uh, part of their work. You know, the sense, as my son has, he's part, of, he's part of a bigger conversation, right? He's part of a history of computer scientists and mathematicians thinking about this problem. And he can't, he knows he can't do it by himself. Yeah. And his advisors apparently know they can't do it by themselves, so they bring in this 25-year-old kid, you know, who, you know, <laughs> you know, who loves to drink coffee and hang out with them, right, you know, and, and talk about this. And so, you know, so again, if, 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 if one of my kinds of questions, observations is, is do we want to recover a kind of Leonardo or Galileo-like, you know, moment. Um, do we also need to be thinking really hard about the kind of collaborative um, work that our scientists do on a daily, regular basis, whether if it's in, you know in laboratories or just sitting at a table with with a piece of paper? And um, you know, I guess maybe my last point or my last question along these lines is that. Um, I feel like, again, in a chapter you didn't reference, but I think it's a chapter where your remarks about what you say at parties, you know, comes from, is that you see philosophy as perhaps a kind of bridge in some ways, that or philosophy of, of all the humanities is perhaps best poised mm -hmm. to take mm -hmm. on both the complex and the simple, or the general and the more local, um, the indexical, as you've put it. Um, and so, you know, and so maybe thinking along those lines, I'm curious what else um, might represent itself as a kind of bridge where some of these conversations, you know, as much as we need to be aware of distinctions and differences, mm -hmm. um, where these more collaborative conversations between divisions and disciplines might happen. I know certainly in the time that you were Dean Environmental Humanities here at, at NYU had a huge push, science studies. Um, up at the med school, medical humanities, um, I think has had has been a player in in, in conversations, um, and so again, I'm I'm curious just to know your thought again. How do we um, how do we think about creating these spaces mm -hmm. where there can be room for thinking about our differences? Maybe right. is one way to put it. Um, although at the same time, surely there are fields like the environmental humanities where we need both an ethics of thinking about you know climate and how to and how to think about climate but we also need the science about how to do it right so maybe I'll stop there if you'd okay. like to respond I'd be thrilled <laughs> but long. I know we want to keep the floor open for many other questions I'll, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things so, so we can open up I, I, I think you put your finger on on the um, um, well let me say the negative thing first I, you know um, projects to recapture the past I've never been very fond of in any, mm -hmm. <laughs> in any dimension, but, but the idea of uh, ways in which um, uh, that uh, that with the differences there can be uh, um, uh, communication and joint projects. I, I think there are joint projects these days. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned one is um, environmental studies here, mm -hmm. at, which which I know something about not every environmental studies um, um, program um, um, in the United States was consciously developed um, to include um, uh, the science, social science, and the humanities. Ours, ours was. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
So there's a project there. There's a project there where um, precisely because uh, the humanities are different, they need that input and mm -hmm. precisely because the scientists are doing the, the getting the data and the information uh, the humanists need new science there's 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 a lot of examples um, not just here but other universities I, I think the the way to do it is project oriented yeah. you, you, you get you get projects um, that um, uh, are designed to be more holistic to, to kind of think about the science mm -hmm. but think about uh, the economics, maybe the politics, but yeah, also think sure. about no, think, think well. about the cultural yeah. implications of it as well. So. Mm -hmm. How we got here, uh, I don't, you know, I don't have any. <laughs> no, I don't know. Know. <laughs> this is not, you're like trying to get, you're giving an epistemology and not a history, so it's an unfair yeah, yeah. question. But. Yeah, yeah, I think it has something to do, but uh, one, of my, one of my colleagues is much better. Michael Strevens in the back of the room is, is uh, I won't put you on the spot, Michael, unless you, were, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you want to say something. Uh, is, is is much uh, more expert on this than I uh, than I am, but but s some of it surely has to do with increasing specialization, um, where um, uh, the history in the sciences. I mean, it's actually the history in the humanities too of of of, of increasing specialization mm -hmm. makes it m more and more difficult to have that that kind of um, mm -hmm. sure. so um, you know. Um, I've given uh, talks in this material before, and 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 people often um, talk about C.P. Snow and C.P. Snow's uh, um, kind of um, uh, regret and uh, um, and dismay that uh, people in the humanities can't understand work um, in in the sciences. Well, one of the things I saw as dean is 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 it's, it's not just the um, um, the Renaissance scholar that can't understand uh, string theory. Most chemists can't understand string theory either. And most biologists don't. So this and, and you know that it's not because they're stupid. It's, it's just because of the the, the, the special the specialization. So yeah. um, one of uh, an essay that's been very influential for me is um, Carlo Ginsburg's. Uh, okay. Uh, an essay that's been very influential for me is Carlo Ginsburg's Clues, Roots of an Evidential Paradigm, in which he talks about the distinction between Galilean sign, science and detective work or medical um, epistemology. Um, and, you know, medicine is a science in which uh, the doctor would be individuating, um, like the detective or the psychoanalyst. Um, and it seems like maybe calling one science and the other humanities is less productive than calling one generalizing and one individuating, one looking for reproducible results, another looking for specificity. I mean, you touched on all these things, yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, and, no. and also these are topics, these are things that come up in the humanities as simply, like in Roman Jakobsen's essay on um, aphasia, this is metaphor and metonymy. Um, and so it's also, you know, in, in Jakobsen's essay, he aligns it with like um, <coughs> poetry and, prose and, and uh, well, metaphor and also metonymy as, as a way of thinking about poetry and realism. Um, so, and, and Jakobsen is also working from a moment in which um, literary uh, fields are attempting to be more like a science in the sense of coming up with generalizing rules about the way the mind works only through metaphor and metonymy. So I just don't, I don't really, um, I mean, obviously, a university is working with certain um, uh, disciplinary distinctions, and those those are necessary. But I don't know that science and humanities are the most useful ways of organizing these distinctions. That may be right. Uh, there's there's enough variety in both the humanities and the, and the sciences that there's um, at most what links them, other than this kind of organizational history, is our family resemblances overlapping. Mm -hmm. um, similarities, um, so that's uh, so. In the book, I do emphasize that I that, that I'm trying to focus in trying to come up with these generalizations on um, one the basic sciences and uh, paradigmatic issues in the basic sciences, and some paradigmatic issues in 
in the humanities. But you're right. There's all sorts of there's all sorts of cases. Um, the case of medicine is a particularly interesting one because um, uh, the whole movement towards personalized medicine is 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 is, is, is a movement that's um, that's predicated on trying to make um, pretty fine distinctions between individuals. Um, um, now, you know, I would push back a little on that. Is that is that still? What's underlying that are, 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 are kind of appeal, uh, appeal to um, uh, uh, generalizations and uh, kind of more simple processes that are operating and that help help explain these 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 individual differences. But, you know, um, it's it's certainly the case whenever you get into um, applications. Any sorts in sciences or engineering, a lot of the distinctions that I talked about get much less, um, much less um, dramatic. And you're exactly right as well. In the humanities, there's all these um, um, movements in pretty much every field where um, where the hope is to kind of push upward to greater and greater um, generality. Um, I think those are to be welcomed. Um, I, I think there's a built-in tension in those things, but you know, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. And the built-in tension is something like this: is is as you try to get um, 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 more and more um, encompassing um, in your your kind of theory about what, whatever it is, um, you need to bring in more and more context to make them applicable to the everyday issues that we. So there's a, there's a bit of um, there's a, there's a bit of a tension there, but you see this in almost every in every field. A kind of wherever wherever there's theorizing, there's there's going there's going to be pushes to greater greater generality. The only the only major point I want to make is when you're talking about issues involving um, humans and human consciousness and, and human societies, there are going to be greater limits on that. Dealing with gravity. So, again, okay. So, uh, I have to say, my first book has been as a Pamela in the science. Mm -hmm. I was young at that, uh, at that time. And it's important to say that uh, the field of the science and, and the poetry are closely related, uh, intervened, and found was uh, um, re revisiting a tradition of which starts in the Middle Ages. So everybody who enters in the field of Italian studies knows now, not years ago, that the science was the center of the kind of poetry. The Sicilians at first, the Vito Cavalcanti, Dante, they wrote. Okay, now this is the first thing. So just on that, I have been working, um, reflecting for years on the fact that actually science and uh, humanities in the sense of poetry, also philosophical thinking, which is intervened with the poetry, no doubt, um, have something in common, which is uh, what Popper has called the logic of scientific research. When I work uh, in the field of the Middle Ages, since uh, we lost the keys to that culture, the past on which the Middle Ages are built, we look for discovering something. Without discovering, in many occasions, we don't have the sense of what we were reading. When, as usually happens, criticism escapes from that, criticism is weak. So science is to research. I remember what Popper said. We cannot trust that we can have knowledge of nature or the world in which we live. What we can do is just to verify our hypothesis. This is written in my mind. Why? Because what we do is we create hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Also, looking at the history of what we have in the back, starting with language, I have been reading the <laughs> writings of my new colleague, Eugenio Ruffini, and he works on checking the meaning of words, mm -hmm. lexicon. Mm -hmm. And um, 
what do, what do we have in common all? We have in common the sense that the details can allow us to understand the text. Mm -hmm. Such details, we search for them in the same way in which the scientist looks for details. I think that we are like scientists in some ways, or wherever we are, <laughs> I can say scientists, minor scientists, but the seriousness of our field is strongly related to this research. This is my opinion. Well, you yeah, know, well, I, um, I, th th there is a little section of the book where, you know, I, I, I do talk about, you know, I'm interested in the distinctions. I think it's important that people be aware of distinctions. But obviously, there are, there are a lot of overlaps as well, and especially overlaps with kind of the kind of seriousness, uh, forming hypotheses, thinking about the hypothesis. I mean, the way the hypotheses I think are, are tested in the sciences is usually uh, different than the humanities. But, but there's but there's a, there's a lot of similarities and a lot of the virtues that are needed to do good scientific research are the same virtues that are needed to do good good work. Work in humanities. So you agree that the methodology can be shared in some ways? At a general enough level, I think that's that that's true. Uh, I still think there are these pressures in most of the sciences uh, that, um, in well, directions, in the directions I talked about, that aren't there, or at least not there to the strength they are. A personal question. Uh, I, uh, you know, I keep thinking back to these areas of uh, inquiry where human endeavors, um, where humanities and sciences necessarily clash. You know, like <coughs> the areas where you know we mentioned one medicine. Um, I could think of public policy, uh, business, um, areas where uh, there's a great influence on human action, but also a large degree of quantifiability, repeatability, transparency. Um, and I think we've seen sort of what happens when uh, the pendulum swings one way or the other. You know, you could immediately think of, of eugenics or uh, the bomb, right? Um, my question to you is, uh, as, a, as a, one as a scholar of humanity most equipped to deal with this tension, as you say, and also as uh, someone involved in uh, hiring faculty, um, how do you as a sort of uh, gatekeeper, uh, you know, what can we do to maintain a proper uh, balance between the two? Uh, is there even a proper balance or, is, or are these areas where um, many humans are impacted so are sort of doomed to this to this tension and this kind of unknowable balance between the two. Yeah, I have, I have um, um, a lot of views about that. I don't know if I can put them all quickly or coherently, but let me just say a few. Um, so, so, so one, you're, you, you, you're right, is that um, when you look at the history of how science is used, the history is often not a pretty one. Um, um, but often those decisions about how science is used get made in political, ethical contexts that are themselves um, highly, highly problematic. So, um, so there's, so in any field of, um, of inquiry, um, which is done well, um, you know, there, 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 there are values of, of thoroughness and disinterestedness and impartiality that's guiding it and it's guiding towards a conclusion. And now, now you have that conclusion that's out there in the world. And in a way, it's no longer under your control. You know, there's all these other forces that are going to use it and shape it and push it this way and that way. So that's, that's, that's the first point. I, I guess again to speak um, um, personally, in my own case. I mean, one of the motivations for the kind of 
hinted at, but, but I can talk a little more about it, is um, you know, while admitting the, that these differences are not as sharp as as uh, as um, as you know the, the organization of a, a university would suggest uh, that they that they are administrators of universities really really have to get um, 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 a sense of um, the kind of inquiries, the kind of values, the kind of aims that are going on in different d different areas, and. Uh, and understand that because it, because it's only by understanding that 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 you'll know how to support it, um, and so so obviously um, there's you know there's always competition for resources, and STEM resources are much more expensive, um, and um, and they're going to remain much more more expensive. Um, but the, but, the, but the flip side of that is the the, the needs the needs of the humanities are not um, you know um, not as extensive they're more extensive than most administrators think they are because you need great libraries for example to, uh, to do it and great libraries are not are not um, inexpensive but you know the, the, the needs are just as real um, and you gotta you gotta find ways of, of of supporting them, and part of these challenges that I talked about are challenges that come. Um, you know, I talked about a long and broad view of you know, a kind of respecting and admiring um, um, projects that have long periods of development and long periods of, and, and doing that across a wide uh, across a wide range of of, of of fields, um, you know, you, doing that and being able to kind of I don't know come up with budgets and way to, ways to support that is not is not easy. And there's all sorts of um, cultural forces operating in in the other direction. I mean, it's some of the some of the forces have to do with uh, funding sources, and, and and here I'm talking to my my friends in the sciences, the, there's um, the, the funding sources in the sciences, um, with some exceptions, um, tend to be overly focused on short-term usefulness. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's harder to get the sustained long-term funding for, uh, uh, for basic sciences. Um, not impossible, but it's just harder and, and it's kind of a mistaken way to think even about science because, I mean, one of, one of the things, if you look at the history of sciences, history of computing is a, is a great example, is, 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 um, is the, 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 the impact of discoveries, uh, at least long-term impact, is almost impossible to predict. Um, uh, th there's a great book on this, it's a short book, um, so I recommend it. It's called the the the, uh, the usefulness of useless knowledge, <laughs> and right. and it's basically you know uh, you got to just have this basic research and you don't know where it's going to go and you know it may go this direction and go that direction but that's you know so I think the sciences are 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 um, are are negatively impacted by a whole series of pressures that I think also negatively impact. Of the humanities, um, our, our students. Um, you know, we're not isolated from the larger culture. Our students um, tend to be kind of um, overly focused, in my view, about um, um, not the last job that they'll have, but the first job they'll have. You know, they're they're, they're kind of interested in getting that. You know, and, and I'm you know, I, I, I'm not so in the ivory tower that I think they should just. Completely ignore these um, pragmatic concerns, but you know you're, you're at a university with resources um, that are going to be unlike what you have for the rest of your life, and not to take advantage of all those resources is 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 um, a big big mistake. But you know there's these cultural pressures, there's parents, there's society that are kind of narrowing. Now you know. Um, 
um, on all sorts of issues. I'm uh, um, accused of being a, um, um, I don't know, an inveterate or naive optimist. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, there, there's a long view to take here that you think, you know, that in the long view, there's, there's, there is going to be a better balance. I think there better be. <laughs> so. Here's one reason to be optimistic. I have a student um, who's a senior right now. She's majoring in Renaissance studies. And she's going to Mount Sinai Medical School next year. And they, they accepted her in her sophomore year. Yeah. And they basically said to her, look, you're, you, know, you, got, you did great on your SATs, whatever, in high school. Obviously, you're a smart young woman. Take biology, you know. It's not like they don't want to take. They don't want her not, to not take any chemistry and biology. But they said, major in something in the humanities. So as a doctor, you know, you know, so six years down the road, you will bring to your work as a doctor a component that many students who just do nothing but, but you know, organic chemistry will not have. Yeah. And so she's free at her last two years at Yale to just take really whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. And you know, she has written about this for the school newspaper. I mean, she's. It's just, so, so that kind of enlightened um, thinking on, on the part of her future employer, as it were, yeah, right, yeah. I think is, is just so refreshing to think that that's happening. So I think, I think that, that's a sign that your optimism is not good. <laughs> is good. misplaced, I hope. Good. Good. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering, uh, in, uh, in this general scheme, where would you place uh, what for me constitutes the major, uh, one of the major uh, divides uh, uh, between the science and humanities, which is uh, the, the usage of formalisms in, in science. I mean, after the, the three-pronged uh, uh, attack uh, uh, launched by first the Hilbertian uh, mathematics, then with uh, uh, new positivist logic, and then with, uh, with cybernetics and, and uh, computers, etc., uh, we have uh, this, this incredibly developed uh, language, uh, one of the main reasons why we cannot read string theory is because of the environment of page, we need to realize that that's a language we do not speak. And I don't think uh, it's uh, just a matter of language, because from the from the very little experience that, that we all have uh, in elementary school with formalism, when we, we learn theories, even the elementary ones, it's a type of creative work that, 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 that is completely different and uh, completely repositions with the meaningful, what, what constitutes a fact at all. Um, in humanities, we are used to hunt for, for a meaning, like, you know, you are just fishing in a pool that you don't see the depth of, uh, and we assume that the darkest, the murkiest it is, it must have more <laughs> meaning. Yeah. <laughs> So what else, when you operate with formalisms, uh, you, you do not have this uh, uh, sense of you know, um, uh, physical contact with uh, the process. The process. The process is kind of invisible to you because the formalisms operate as an interface that make you see much less. And once they resolve the issue for you, instead of uh, having a sense of gain, you actually have a sense of disappearance because once you, you have the formula and you can operate with the formula instead of with the, the granular uh, analysis, um, it's like uh, something has disappeared in a puff. So you wonder whether your other way of operating with meaning and depth is actually just uh, a self-delusional, or should I put it like some kind of contraption we have because we have in absence of a formalism or, or, or of something that would then make the whole thing disappear. So, but the point is, this to me would seem to be uh, the edge, really, that uh, distinguishes the creative process between what we do in humanities, where we are still allowed to operate with incredibly loose analogies. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's really a problem. See, everything seems to be fitting, and you can make everything work, and analogies tend to expand yeah. and to be less and less powerful. Mm -hmm. And with this other field that uh, somehow is operating with this kind of uh, interlanguage. Hmm. So I do talk a little bit, uh, but your remarks uh, are getting me to think in other directions than, than the ones I did in the book. I, you know, I talk a little bit about um, the language of mathematics and 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 formal models in the, in the sciences, and I connect that with 
um, these issues of, of, of de-emphasizing perspective, de-emphasizing um, indexicality, and uh, um, and I talk a little bit about the importance of uh, of uh, natural languages uh, for the humanities and connect that a bit. The natural languages, as, as your remarks were, were hinting at, are, you know, they kind of evolved out of human lives and uh, the need for distinction. So they have histories to them and they're kind of attached to uh, uh, attached to the world so there's there's, there's a lot of I don't know um, um, again these are probably not the, the right terms to uh, talk about natural languages but using the term of my book there's a lot of kind of indexical information in 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 languages as part of the richness that makes them suited for the humanities where they're not as suited uh, not as suited for um, um, the sciences, but you know, as you as you talked about these formalisms, the other the other thing that was popping in my head is um, um, which, which is kind of orth orthogonal to some of your not inconsistent, but just kind of going in a different direction from from your remarks is is the sciences at the same time are are much more deeply involved with not than the humanities are not just with understanding the world but controlling it. Um, you know, it's usually through engineering and app, 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 applications. So these, 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 these formalisms, which seem very abstract and you know might seem as your language go poof, um, you know, they have to work. <laughs> so they, you know, they, they, so so they get they get tied, they get you know, tied to the world not just through a kind of sense of understanding things that you thought you didn't understand before how things fit together, but they're used to, they're used to do things. Um, and and that's, I, I'm not saying that the humanities don't have practical implications and practical consequences. I think they do. Um, they tend to be more diffuse, longer term, less specific than those in the, in the, in the sciences. Um, but I think the, this, the difference you're pointing at is a pretty important difference, the, the use of formal models, uh, reliance on mathematics um, in the sciences. So, yes? I, I wanted to ask you about interdisciplinary Yeah, yeah. Is hard. Um, I'm in the English department, and when I write about science fiction, I try to be really diligent about looking up what that concept means. But but then I find myself hedging. You know, I'm not a scientist, so you know, so I write in this way. So I just from your amazing experience of those 700 meetings, of <laughs> <laughs> they weren't all interesting. I assure you. <laughs> So, 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 so I do think it's important for people. Uh, there's uh, one of the ways which um, I don't want to be um, understood is I, I think there are these different areas, different inquiries, different different kinds of progress. But but I don't want to suggest that the, the humanities can or should um, um, ignore the sciences. In fact, I think quite the opposite. I think one of the ways in which progress is made in in the humanities the analogy with law was was supposed to be it's it's you know changes outside the humanities you know some, some are evolving ethical and, and uh, political norms that kind of force reassessment of of, of previous work in, in humanities we have um, 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 uh, you know very um, visible examples of of that, 
but, but, but some of it is coming to grips with, with new scientific knowledge. I, I think um, in, in, in our age, it's um, um, my look at uh, work in the humanities is, um, well, let me take a step back. Um, the, the, the theory of the, the, the theory of evolution is, is is kind of thought to be old hat. People say yeah 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 yeah. It was not to say it's universally accepted, but um, but it's it um, represents a seismic shift um, in how humans think of themselves uh, in relation to the rest of the living world. Um, to, to think to think of themselves as being shaped by the very same processes that shaped other living things in this world, as opposed to a very long tradition um, um, that's kind of embedded in lots lots of our culture, where humans animals are are are, are separate. Um, lots of efforts to to um, um, d to emphasize the differences as opposed to diminish the differences between that, and you know sometimes it's it's by looking for some property that humans long duration looking for properties that humans have that other living things don't have, whether it's property of reason or a soul or whatever. So, so again, given the um, how long the theory of evolution has been around, it seems. May seem strange to say that it is 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 still reshaping um, our our culture and how we how we how we think about things, and I see this in the humanities. I see I, I see the humanities. Um, um, I mean, it's not like it's not like people in the humanities um, denied the, the theory of, of evolution, but but I see, for example, across the humanities. Um, 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 not just in a few areas of the humanities, lots of interest in reassessments of, of ways of thinking about the relationship uh, between humans and animals. And it's not all going in one direction. I mean, it's various direction. And I think all that is a result of trying to figure out ways of dealing with issues that are traditional concerns of the humanities that hook up in a respectable way to current scientific, scientific knowledge. So, so I don't know about the, the specifics of your work of, of science fiction, but I, 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 I encourage you to keep, <laughs> keep, keep pushing in that direction and kind of thinking about connections between your work and what's going on in science, as hard as it may be. I think we should, I, I, oh, one more question. Another yes. question. Yeah. I, I don't know how much this is a, a question, but um, I was just thinking, going back to epistemology of uh, where you know, this tension arises between the sciences and the humanities. And how much is it because we've, in modernity, modernity veered off from um, a sort of um, philosophical way of uh, thinking uh, about the end goal of uh, our um, interests and our projects and scientific pursuits and in the humanity, and how much is this politicized by our capitalist system uh, where, uh, you know, depending who controls the modes of production, we, we tend to give different values to, to that type of work. Um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of pressures, economic and every, every sort of way, to, um, um, well, you know, put metaphorically, is to um, not connect people or not connect inquiries as opposed to. I, I think you need to stop. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, and you know, let me get back to my obsession, which is universities. I think universities are at their very, at their very best. They're not always at their very best, but at, but at their very best, they're they're places where all these different disciplines can come can come together and um, and. You know, the, 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 this is pretty deep in the of the the history and traditions of universities. You know, you go all the way back to uh, before the Common Era, the the great library at Alexandria. You know, they, 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 
they weren't just interested in a few areas. They were interested in this kind of breadth of, 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 of human knowledge. And then you, then you kind of leap up into um, um, uh, e even some of the... Um, um, Do you think there was a specific common thread in that time? them closer to uh, collaboration? Sometimes it was religion, actually. Um, you know, there, I was going to mention the Buddhist monasteries in Japan and in China, which, you know, obviously were interested in uh, in Buddhism and Buddhist themes. But, you know, they, they trained students in medicine and astronomy and, and, and math and languages. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the great universities that were founded in, in Europe in the Middle East, uh, the Middle Ages, Bologna, Paris, Oxford, Cambridge. Again, all, all those places, all those universities were committed to um, systematically collecting, producing, and preserving for the ages knowledge across a very, very wide range of fields. Basically, you know, all the things that humans tend to be interested in. And again, there's lots of pressures to get get us off that. Um, and the thing that I know the best, which is which is universities, I think can be again, especially research, <laughs> research universities, uh, can be. Um, you know, they're obviously not going to solve all of that, but they can be a counter pressure against against this. So. That's all. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.